Hello and welcome to the My Heritage webinar series. I'm Jeff Rasmussen, your host, broadcasting to you live from webinar headquarters in Middleton, Idaho. Today we have Maureen Taylor with us, who is live in the state of Rhode Island for her class, Integrating Old Photos into Your Family History Research. Should be a really fun topic for all of us today. Also on hand here in the background to field any My Heritage specific questions is Daniel Horowitz expert genealogist from my heritage so thanks uh, both thanks to both Maureen and Daniel and thanks to all of you for registering for today's live webinar more than 1800 of you from all over the world have registered so wherever and whenever you are glad to have you with us and now I'd like to introduce our speaker Maureen Taylor also known as the photo detective is an internationally recognized expert on historic photograph identification and photo preservation Sought out by clients all over the world from as far away as New Zealand, her pioneering work in historic photo research is unprecedented, evidenced by her success in solving photo mysteries. The author of several books, scholarly articles, and online columns, she has been featured in numerous publications, including the Boston Globe, the New York Times, Better Homes and Gardens, and was dubbed the nation's foremost historical photo detective by the Wall Street Journal. Her focus is on helping people rediscover their family history one picture at a time, and is passionate about getting folks to dig deep into their family history to tell the story of their ancestors. For more than a decade, she searched for images of individuals who lived during the Revolutionary War, but also lived into the age of photography. It's currently a two-volume set titled The Last Muster, and the quest for, mo for more photographs is ongoing. There's now a set of films, a revolutionary trio. Please put together your virtual hands, and let's give Maureen Taylor a nice warm webinar welcome. Maureen, how are you, and welcome to the show. I'm good, Jeff. How are you? Oh, I'm I'm terrific. We've got a a, a fun topic and Maureen Taylor, so uh, it doesn't get much better than that. Uh, <laughs> and Maureen, your screen's looking good. Just go into that full screen mode, and I'll and bounce to the out. There. there we go. Okay, Maureen, it looks perfect. And well, it's terrific. hold on, hold on. It's okay. It now looks perfect. Okay, the time's all yours. <laughs> Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I'm looking forward to uh, talking with you this afternoon about my favorite thing to talk about in the whole wide world, which is family history and photography and how they come together. And today's talk, Integrating Photographs into Family History, is actually pretty clear, and the title is what we're going to talk about. I'm specifically going to talk about some photo identification techniques you're going to want to use so that you can make the most out of your MyHeritage account. So let me go to the next slide. So this is the new design for MyHeritage, and you may not have it yet, but you will soon. And it allows you to put a family photograph on the screen on, on what I call it your masthead, sort of like a newspaper masthead. And this is my maternal grandmother, two of her siblings, and her parents, as well as an, a niece and a nephew, although my, my lovely little head is over the nephew's head. And in the new design, there's even this little sort of blog roll kind of thing in the middle, which it tells you all your recent activities. And right at a glance, you can see whatever wonderful picture you want to put in your masthead, how many people you might already have in your tree, how many photographs, no, I don't have that many yet, but I'm going to put them up there. How many discoveries have been made, and we're gonna talk about that this afternoon. And I have more DNA kits with my heritage than I do pictures, but I'll make that change. So, what are we gonna talk about this afternoon? We're gonna talk about all the things that you can do to keep track of the information in those photographs and how to find out more about those pictures. So if you are looking for all of your family photographs on the My Heritage, your My Heritage site, they are under Family Tree. So if you were to click on Family Tree in this menu, you'd get a drop down and it would ask you to see your photos and it shows them as a collection of tiles. Now, if you click on any of those, it shows you specifically some additional information about that image. 
And we're going to talk about all the different things that you can see in that, what I call as a photo dashboard. But before you start sharing images online, I'd like to just step back for a moment and talk about a lecture that I gave on the Legacy Family Tree webinars called Share Pictures Responsibly, What Genealogists Need to Know. So before you start sharing your pictures all over the web, you might want to watch this particular webinar because I talk about things like the right resolution which to post your images and also how to watermark them. Think of your watermark as the source citation for your image so that someone will always know that that picture came from your collection, whether or not that information gets separated or not. Now, the good news is on my heritage that does not happen. So here's what that photo dashboard looks like. You'll see a lot of information associated with that image. There's the name, there's who submitted it, there's all this extra stuff that you can do with it, pictures in your, your family tree photograph collection. Uh, the green has something to do with tagging faces. There's a lot of information here, and there's a lot of information that you can add to this dashboard. But suppose you're thinking, I have all these family photographs, and I know some things about them, but I don't know enough about them. So we're going to talk about some photo, basic photo identification techniques that you can use to start telling a fuller story of those family photographs and put more information in your photo dashboard. One of the things I want to talk about is a file name for your pictures. So if you scan them and you scan them at a preservation uh, resolution, which is 1200 to 600 to 1200 DPI as a TIFF file, that's fine, but you're going to want to name that file. And that's not necessarily the resolution you're going to want to upload to a website. But if you're going to name that scan, here's an idea. You want to keep it uh, so that you have the last name of the person, the first name of the person, and their year of birth. So that year of birth, I usually do B period or B and the year. So my grandfather or great grandfather would be Taylor underscore George underscore B 1856. The 001 in the front of the file name is a digital number. So if you, and it's important to put those zeros there. So if you start numbering your pictures one and then this file name, and then two, and, the, and then you get to 11, actually one and 11 will be next to each other. But if you use the zero, zero in front of it, then the zero, zero, one, and the zero, one, one will have numbers in between it. It won't be right next to each other. So it's important to use those zero, zeros. Now, if you think you have a thousand pictures of the same person, then you might want to add an extra zero. But suppose you don't know the details behind your family photographs. How are you supposed to find out? And what kinds of things do you need to investigate when you start looking at those family photos? I can help. The first thing you want to do is start with the basic five questions that have to do with photo identification. And you have this photograph in front of you. If you close your eyes and you think about an image in your collection that really troubles you because you don't know enough about it, some of the questions that you're going to want to ask about it are not only who's in the picture, but who took the photograph. Maybe it's a candid photograph. Maybe it's a studio photographer. What are they wearing? What are they doing? What are they holding? There's all kinds of levels to these questions. Where was it taken? That may be key to figuring out whether or not this photograph was taken when they lived in one particular area versus another area, or maybe it was taken before or after immigration. When was it taken? A lot of times you're trying to figure out, you may know who's in the picture, but not when it was photographed. And answering all these other questions will help you narrow down a time frame. And your conclusion is basically, what information you have found out about that photograph based on the answers to these questions. And one of the most important things to think about in terms of your family photographs is things like 
provenance. So who owned that image before you, who owned it before them, and who owned it all the way up to the date that it was created when those ancestors sat for it. So if you think it's a 1930s photograph, there's not as many generations between you and that 1930s photograph as there is between you and say a photograph taken in the 1860s. So it's important to think it through, like think about which side of the family this unidentified or partially identified photograph might have come from so that you end up researching them on the right side of the tree, not the wrong tree for that image. So the way this works out is it's an endless circle of facts and you're trying to fact check those facts and think about whether or not they're correct. Think about how that fits into your family history. And you're gonna look at things like photograph. Well, what type of photograph is it? Who took that picture? What are they wearing? And it's an endless cycle because once you start comparing this information with your family history, it may or may not make sense, in which case you have to go back and think it through again and think, well, maybe I didn't identify that one little piece the, you know, to be what it should be. It throws it all off. It does all come together, though. And keeping track of all that information is very important. So let's start with what type of photo is it? So image formats, basically the first type of photograph is something called a daguerreotype. And the first commercially successful daguerreotypes were from 1839. And that's what we have on the left. So we have this woman actually in the 1850s. And I know it's the 1850s based on her bonnet and her collar, but it is a daguerreotype and they're shiny and reflective and they stay popular until about 1860, 65, depending on where someone lived. Now, daguerreotypes are one of a kind unique images. The only way to make, to get another one is if you sat for a second daguerreotype or if someone brought it to the studio to have it copied. So often we see daguerreotypes being copied, especially when paper photography starts becoming popular. And that's what we have on the right is a copy of a daguerreotype. Amber types are on glass. A daguerreotype is on a shiny silver coated copper plate. So that's why it's so reflective. But an amber type is on glass and it's actually a negative image until it's backed with something dark. So this little boy sits in this uh, lovely chair and the amber type debuts in about 1854. And so it, all of these cased images have parts. You have the, the little boy, then you have the cover, the, the mat, which frames him, you have the cover glass, you have the preserving strip, which holds the whole image sandwich together. And then that all fits very snugly into the case. Amber types stay available until somewhere around 1870, again, depending on where you live. Tin types, they're patented in 1856 and you can still get tin types today, really. So how do you know what year a particular tintype was taken? And a t let me just start by saying a tintype is a misnomer. So a tintype is actually not on tin, it's on iron. And that makes it magnetic. So you can identify a tintype by its, you know, whether or not it's magnetic or not. But this young woman with her tilted hat, I happen to know just based on her fashion clues that this was taken circa 1870. It's that tipped hat that really clued me into when this might have been taken. And if you happen to notice, she's had her, the cheeks in this photograph pinked to make her look a little more alive. Now the image on the far right is actually from the 1930s. These are WPA photographers using a tintype camera to do their work. All of these old photographic methods are now in style again, and they're being taught at art schools across the country. So if you decide that you want to really fool your ancestors, your descendants, you can have a daguerreotype made dressed up in an old outfit and see what happens. There's also a type of 
photo postcard that was very, very popular around the turn of the century, meaning 1900. And they are called real photo postcards. So our ancestors could actually buy a camera that had the right size, right size camera, to make their own real photo postcards. Or they could go to a studio and have real photo postcards taken. But they're really wonderful. And you can get a little more specific with the date on all of these images by studying details about them like with a daguerreotype or an amber type in a case, perhaps there's a marking on the mat or a marking on the case. On the paper photographs, there might be the name of a photographer that you can research, and we'll talk about that in just a second. On a real photo postcard, oftentimes it's the stamp box design that helps us clue in to when that picture might have been taken. So if there is a photographer's name on the back of one of those paper photographs, there is usually details associated with it that you can research. So for instance, in this case, we know that Mr. Angel has left the firm of Manchester Brothers because they've crossed his name out. Now, when did that happen? You can use city directories and census records and even Google the name to find out more about the photographer on the back of your family photograph. In this case, I happen to have researched this studio, and I know that they were at 73 Westminster Street for a very long time, but they changed partners, and they changed the font and style of the design on the back and the front of their cards, and all of that helps narrow down when a picture was taken. Fashion clues are a little trickier. So here we have a group portrait of individuals from March of 1844, and it is an identified group. So we can research each and every one of these individuals and think about their lives and think about how this photograph fits into their life story, into their timeline. And there's a lot going on in this picture. I don't know if you can see it from where you are, but there is a woman who is a Quaker this is a Philadelphia family, and she's on the far left. The daughter-in-law is in the middle, and the daughter-in-law's mother's on the far right. The one question about this picture is, you know, you can figure out, even if the March 1844 wasn't there, there's a lot of clothing clues in this image. So with women's clothing, you look at the shape and style of the woman's bodice, the style of her hat, the shape and style of her sleeves, for instance how she wears her hair. For men, you have to pay particular attention to ties, lapels, and suit lapels, as well as uh, vests. Length of pants, width of pants, type of shoe. There's a, oh, so many little details to think about when you're studying the fashion clues. Then you take all of this information that you've accumulated from these uh, three techniques that I've explained. And then you compare that to your family history. Does it add up? What's wrong with it if it doesn't add up? What's missing? In this case, for this to be this family, which I have researched, in March of 1844, the big question in my mind is, where is their baby? Because by this point, if this photograph is dated correctly, they already had a baby and maybe the date is wrong or maybe they didn't want to have the baby photographed with everyone else. There's a, for every mystery that you solve, there'll be something other little detail that you decide you need to know a little bit more about. But you can keep track of all of this information and you should keep track of it in your genealogical software program. Now, if you want to know more about photo identification techniques, I have a new course. It's called Identifying Family Photographs. It's available through my website, MaureenTaylor.com. It's a nine-lesson video course with handouts and worksheets to help you along the way. There is something on MyHeritage that's, and there's a lot of things on the MyHeritage photo dashboard that are pretty cool. But this is one of the coolest. This is where MyHeritage does the work for you. 
In other words, using something called instant discoveries, which was formerly called smart matches, they connect you with other individuals who share information. Let's show you how that works. So the benefits of using the instant discoveries, and remember, it used to be called smart matches. Now it's called instant discoveries. You can actually go on the website, and I'll show you where that is on the screen in just a second. You can narrow it down from just broad instant discoveries to just photo discoveries. Now you can look up to 10 different images a day in your instant dis photo discoveries. Along the way, you need to verify, accept, or reject individual images. And this is a feature only for Premium Plus or complete account members. It's well worth it though. So on your MyHeritage page, if you go along the top, you'll see home, family tree, you get to discoveries. In instant discoveries, you can do all discoveries, person discoveries, or photo discoveries. And so in this photo discovery section, here's what we're looking at. You can view a photo discovery that can add seven personal photos for people in your family tree. Or in this one, you can view a photo discovery that can add one personal photo for a person in your family tree. So each and every one of these images has been matched to you because you share family with the individual that has these images. And that's, that's an amazing thing because I hear from my clients all the time how connecting with their cousins gives them information about their family history but also gives them photographs that they never knew existed and information attached to those photographs that they didn't know existed. So instant discoveries, the photo discoveries on MyHeritage actually connects you with these people. Now, as I mentioned, you have a limit of 10 matches per day, but that doesn't mean you can't go back every single day if you wanna see that you have more matches. It's just you're, you're limited to 10 in one day because they want you to think about in terms of verifying, accepting, or rejecting. Before you just automatically accept all these people, you wanna make sure that they really are the right people for your family tree. So in Verify, you're gonna do exactly that. You're gonna look at that photograph, you're gonna look at the information in that match, and you're going to make sure that it matches what you know about that person, and the photo information matches that information. So in other words, you wanna make sure that the photo and the information come together to be the right person. If it is, you can click verify and, and move on. You can actually click accept, and that photo copies to your tree. All that information on the photo and the photo then gets copied to your MyHeritage website. And that face in that image will be that person's profile image on your page and in your tree. Now, each one that's accepted has a source citation so that you always know which tree it came from. That's good information. That's like citing your sources. Plus you can contact those people. So the photos and trees all come together your photos and the photos that you find through the instant discoveries then get attached to a family tree. So I love the fact that the photographs and the family history information are actually linked. That's really important because oftentimes we have big collections of photographs and we have all this family history research, but the two are not joined together, but they are here. You know at a glance who owns the images and guess what? Through those instant discoveries, you can connect with the owner of those images through the instant photo discovery. So all you have to do, so you have a photo discovery and it shows you how that might connect in your tree. And then it shows you can click on the underscored link for the family site owned by this particular person, Laura Smith, or you can actually click on Laura Smith and contact her and ask her what else she knows about the family photograph, what else she knows about the people in the photograph, if she has any other images that she hasn't put on her tree yet. This is an amazing tool and we're gonna talk about collaborative 
photo discoveries a little later in the presentation. If you want to reject the discovery, because maybe it's not the kind of picture you want to put on your tree, or maybe it's not the right person. So if you just click the little X uh, on the screen, or you can actually under here, under the photo discovery, there's a little wording that says reject this discovery. If you reject that discovery, beware. They go away permanently and they won't pop up as a match again. The whole tree for that match disappears from your discoveries. So if it's something you think, well, it's not the right person right now, but you might want to revisit it, then maybe just leave it alone and it'll pop up again. But if you decide this is absolutely not the right match, reject the discovery and you'll never see it again. So. We've gone through some basic photo identification and you've accumulated some information on one of your family photographs. You've connected with some of your instant discoveries and added some pictures to your tree and perhaps rejected some of them as well. So the question is, what can you do with your photos on MyHeritage? You can do a lot. Think of it as a place for you to collect your research, to ask questions, to collaborate with family members, and to see at a glance everything that you know about not only a particular image, but the person in that image. So it's really important to try to step back and do that photo research so you can fill out the information on my heritage as fully as possible. When you decide you're going to add more pictures to your family tree, and that's one of the things that will be helpful to you in making more instant discoveries, is to make sure that you use a picture of a person rather than an icon or a symbol probably don't want to just use a generic symbol like a flag or a, maybe a fraternal symbol to identify that person. You're really hoping to use an actual photograph of a person when you start adding pic pictures to your family tree. You want to try to fill out the caption that you have with each picture as fully as possible. Even if you don't know the full name of the person, you want to add as many details as you can, such as maybe it's a surname. Perhaps in a part of the photo dashboard, you can say, this photograph came down to me from, and you can put that information. There's all kinds of things you can do with this to make your photographs really speak to you later when you're trying to write your family history. It's important to at least basically add, if you can figure it out, place, person, and keywords, because those items are used by the search engines and enable some of those instant discoveries. One of the cool features of the MyHeritage Photo Dashboard is your ability to tag faces. So the information on who's in a picture is no longer lost. So in, especially in a huge group portrait, you know what I mean. That's like one of the most common questions I get is, how am I going to identify all those people in that group portrait? Well, with the MyHeritage Photo Dashboard, you can actually scroll over a face and click on it. And I've included this picture of my birthday from ages ago, uh, just to make it simple. And I can put my first name and last name, identify the gender, born on which particular date, identify if they're alive or not. It gives you an example of how to put the date. I can include an email address for that person so you don't lose that information either. And this person is a family member. You can, there's a little drop down menu here. And you can describe this person as well and then click the add button. Now you may have noticed there's additional people in this picture. That's actually my dad. And if you click on his face, um, it looks like I've actually in the photo, I have already added him to the picture. 
but this is just how you tag one particular photo. Now, once you have tagged someone, when you come to a picture and you look over here on the right and it says in the photo, if you roll over a name, like I rolled over my grandmother's name here, Eliza J. Taylor, it lights up in a green box. Now imagine you're looking at a family reunion picture with about 20 or 25 or 30 or 40 or like our family reunions with like 50 or 60 people in it and we always do a group portrait. I can go in and tag each and every one of those people. It'll add it over here on the right and then I can scroll over the name and see exactly who they are. And any one of my family members that see my tree as well can then look and see who's in that picture as well. So it's, it's a very nice feature to be able to tag, identify, and actually see them right there in front of you over time. Plus, the more information you put in your photo dashboard, the more likely you are to find more instant discoveries. In your photo dashboard, there is a more information option. So if you were to click, so there's the name of the person, Lars Hansen, and over to the right, there's a little thing that says more info. When you click on that, it's telling you that for each of the people tagged in this photograph, you can add additional information. So you can add photos, it tells you you have two photos of him. You can add a profile page. You can show in the family tree. You can add ancestors or descendants of this person as well. Think of it in terms of a sort of at a glance overview of not only the person, but the person in the picture. There's actually a little place here called details. And if you click on details, you can add additional information. So, you can change the caption for the image, but if you want to retain that image number, this would be the place to put it. Anything else you want to say about this photograph, you can put in the details section. I'm sure you can think like this was a, any kind of little story you want to put, you can put that there as long as it's fairly short. You can put uh, information on place and any other things you know about the people, maybe something specific about what they're wearing. This woman is wearing a pin. Perhaps her grandmother gave her the pin. You can keep track of all of this information in this one place, either under more info or under details. This is what it looks like if you don't click on any of it. So you've got Lars Hansen here. We've got him over here as well. We've got the more info. We can add their faces. We can tag them, the baby and the mom. We can add additional details. It shows you what albums the image appears in. And there's even more that you can do with this photo dashboard. Actually down here, I wanna show you this. Right here at the bottom, oops, we'll go back to that. Down here, there's additional information about the photograph, and we'll talk about that in just a second. For every image, you have a unique image URL. If you want to share that URL with other family members, you have to make sure that you set your privacy settings on your MyHeritage site to public. If you decide you don't want to share them, then you'd have to set put the settings as private. So in this case, suppose you knew, this is Houdini actually in the middle, and you know who this person is on the left, but you don't know who this person is on the right, and you decide you wanna send that to your cousin just using that URL, the album must be public. So basically under, con under your privacy settings in MyHeritage, you can have your member preferences, and one of them is to make it public versus private so that other individuals can see that. MyHeritage takes privacy concerns very seriously. So if you say private, no one will see it. If you say public, then it gives you the ability to share more things. 
In the photo dashboard, there are even some built in editing tools. So up over the image, so this is the picture, up over the top of the image, there is a place right now I just have a generic title for my image. It's called Family 270. That tells you exactly how many images I've already scanned. But suppose I want to change that and I want to say uh, Maureen's birthday party, give the address uh, here. I can do that. I can edit the title, the date, and the place. But again, maybe I want to keep this sort of basic scanning thing that I was doing uh, before I change the file name. And I can put that in details. This is submitted by me. If I, I can click on that and get a little bit more information, I can view the image full size, which sometimes can help you see things in the picture that you might have overlooked. You can download the picture. Say you lost a family photograph. You can download the digital version. You can rotate it. Say it's upside down or backwards. You can do that, or you can delete it. You can do all of these things in this basic editing tool section of the photos. There are ways to collaborate using MyHeritage. And I mentioned before that my clients often say to me that reaching out to their DNA matches or reaching out to family that they know or family that they haven't met yet results in so many more details about their family. So in my case, I reached out to a DNA match and discovered that her great grandmother was actually the sister of my grandmother. And it's a, I love this moment because she's asked me if I could help her, and this is the funny part, she asked me if I could help her identify some family photographs that she didn't, I couldn't, didn't know who they were. Because of course there's several generations there between her and, and uh, what was my grandmother. And she had pictures I had never seen before. Now, if I put those images up in my MyHeritage account, and I happen to know that a lot of my instant discoveries on MyHeritage are connected to my maternal line of the family, that I may find additional images of my grandmother and her siblings. I may find pictures of my great-grandparents. Because photographs don't come down in the family in a straight line. They sort of wiggle all over the place. They don't come down from parents to the oldest, to the oldest, to the oldest. It really has to do with who's the last person living at home, who's taking care of mom and dad towards the end of their lives, who has the interest in taking care of those pictures or taking care of that memorabilia. Those are the people that generally end up with the photographs. And there are photo collections that are divided up again and again and again over time so that you have five siblings and maybe each of the five get a piece of the family photo collection, the ones that they're most interested in. And maybe the same thing happened to my grandparents' generation or maybe my great-grandparents' generation. So the, the family photo collection gets very diffuse. So if you want to collaborate with cousins, this is also a way of bringing those photograph collections back together. So to collaborate well, one of the things you need to do is to add more people, people tags, additional information for those photographs, and all of that information is then transferred with the picture. You can contact the submitter through that image and you can see the source citation for that tree. And I advise you to contact each and every one of those instant discoveries that you make. Contact them. See how, try to define more clearly how they're connected to you and what else they may have and share some of what you may have. And you'll be doing that through your family trees, but I'm willing to bet you not every piece of information, not every photograph has been uploaded to their MyHeritage site.
So you want to contact them, and it's a good idea when you contact someone like this. Uh, one of my rules of contacting someone is to say, hi, give them my name. Even though you're reaching out through MyHeritage, you can say you popped up in an instant discovery, and you want to say something about, this is how we're related and I could use some assistance with this, or can I help you with your research? It's, it's just a great way to talk with people. So when you have a person in your family tree, so we have Isaac. When you look at Isaac's profile page, this is some of what you see. And you're going to be able to see this once this person in the photograph gets transferred to your tree. So we have Isaac. We have birth dates, death dates, where. So you want to put places because all of this is important. We have a picture of him. That's what happens when you accept a photograph of someone. That photograph then becomes part of their profile picture. You can see at a glance what research has happened. For this, there are two record matches, 25 smart matches, and then you can do additional research into this person. You can see how many people have viewed this profile. You can see their immediate family. But under the source citation, you can also see that this was the, remember instant discovery used to be called a smart match. So this tells you that the source was a smart match, the confidence level, it's secondary evidence, the date at which it was added, and the, this is a citation text that you can add as well, personal photo of Isaac added via a photo discovery. So all of that can appear and help you never lose track of what the connection is with the person and that photograph. So the photo dashboard that we've talked about encourages the collaboration because you're working with others. You're making those instant discoveries and sharing information. You can even use something called the comment field to ask a question and your family member will see that. That's shared with everyone who is a member of your family tree. You don't actually have to go back and check your MyHeritage tree all the time. You'll actually get email notifications talking about new things like that. And they can't, this is important, they can't globally change the details you've added. They can only do that on their site. So they can't necessarily change the name of a person that you've identified in a photograph. They can only do that on their site. They can't cha change the people that you've identified in your photos. So the comment field is a really another cool feature for MyHeritage. So underneath this family photograph of me on my birthday, I can share my thoughts about this photo. I can write my comment. I can write a little story. I wonder what kind of cake that was. And thank goodness I could probably ask my mom and she'll probably remember. And I can even ask a question. So I could say, even though I know where this was taken, I can say, I wonder where this was taken. Does anyone know? And likely one of my older cousins might be able to have that information. And if they had access to my tree, they could help me out there. You can keep track of your research notes. So you can put comments here saying, these are the things I still need to research. You could put that in your details section as well. But a comment, writing comments might be the the best way to go about doing all of that. I think you can be creative with what you put in your comment field and how you use it. Now imagine that this was your family photograph and think about what we've learned so far. So we went over photo identification. I can tell you this is a card photograph. We could put that in the detail. We know something about their hats. Perhaps we've researched their hats. Perhaps we've estimated how old they are. Perhaps we just want to say something about her adorable little purse or the fact that she's wearing a hoop skirt. Or perhaps there's photographer's information on the back that we want to keep track of in the details. And then you decide to upload this to your website on MyHeritage. So when you go to that, 
when you go to family tree on the main dashboard and you click family tree and then you go to your family photographs in the upper right hand corner is a little button so you can upload your images through there and then add all your information and the images must be attached to an album so you'll actually be specifying which album it goes in which is why it's really important to try to figure out which branch of the family it is because you could create separate albums for different people you could create separate albums for different branches of the family it's really up to you this is a lovely late 1860s image by the way now if you want to enhance the collaboration you can do that as well and this is a trick that Daniel Horowitz showed me and it's a pretty cool one so say you have a big group portrait and you have faces that you don't recognize you can actually tag those faces and call them unknown unknown one unknown two unknown three and then when that appears over here on the right hand side because you've tagged them as unknown one you can even put a little question or comment in your comment field this will help people who are looking at this photograph know that you haven't identified this person yet and maybe they can help you out with that now imagine you've created you've looked at all your photographs you've identified the ones you can you've uploaded all of them including the ones that you have identification problems with and you've commented on them you have filled in the details you've done the research you you you're really trying to tell the story of your family through your family tree information and your photographs now imagine what you'll know about your family now as the photo detective I believe that every photo tells a story sometimes you know the whole story and sometimes you know pieces of it and sometimes pieces of it come dripping back to you through unexpected connections with cousins and grandparents and all kinds of people may have stories neighbors might even have stories so once you've done all of this work think about what stories you might uncover by doing this photo search by finding those photo discoveries by completing those photo dashboards for each image and think about what your relatives may learn that they didn't know but because you've done the work they now know so much more about your family Anyway, if you want to find out more, you can go to my website, MaureenTaylor.com, sign up for my newsletter, follow my Facebook Lives or podcasts. It's been great talking with you today, and I can't wait to hear what questions you have. So, Jeff and Daniel, well, let's go to the next part. Yeah, thank you, Maureen. And by the way, I've put her website in your chat area, everybody, so uh, you've got one-click access there. Also, her syllabus is up on the webinars registration page up at the FamilyTreeWebinars.com site, so that's where you can access that. Maureen, I'm going to switch over here. Let's do a couple of door prizes. And for our first door prize, uh, this is the book Identifying Family Photographs, the Handbook. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, your book? So this is a new book for me. It's just been out for about a month. And I started to think that people learn better in an interactive uh, setting. So there's lots of worksheets in here. So I raise a topic. I ask you questions about a picture or, you know, there are questions asked about a picture. You can fill in the blanks. It sort of leads you through the identification process and you can use it as a it's a workbook handbook kind of thing. So it's all kinds of information. And there's lots of research prompts and ways to keep track of your research. And, I, of course, I give you advice on labeling pictures. Oh, good. Uh, and that's available up at MaureenTaylor.com. And uh, neat to – you said this is brand new as, as in the past month. Is that right? In the past month. Oh, good. Okay, so brand new book from – uh, Maureen Taylor. Uh, let's go over to who our winner is here today. We're going to go to Robin Jones. Uh, Robin, congratulations, and we'll be in touch with you about uh, fulfilling uh, this. Uh, let's go next to 
a the door prize for a one year my heritage complete plan so this gets you access to the family site the premium plus family site subscription uh, plus the data subscription which now has access to uh, i think more than 9.5 billion historical records uh, so those of you here all you have to do is be here and you're eligible uh, let's go to let me go to valerie maples Valerie, congratulations, and uh, just, uh, again, just watch your email from us. Uh, congratulations. And I think my next slide is my questions slide. Uh, Valerie, yeah, you're welcome, Valerie. She's really excited here. Um, well, Maureen, so I've got questions, and then Daniel, if you ever want to pop in for, uh, you know, specific uh, and technical questions on my heritage, you're absolutely welcome to. Uh, so, Maureen, oh, and... Okay. Li Lilia writes in saying she's glad she's retired so she has time to work on all of this. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I don't. I, retirement's a long ways away for me, but gosh, I love what I I do every day. And it seems like Maureen, you love what you do uh, with uh, identifying and researching these old photos. Um, uh, very fortunate. Well, let's go to some questions here. Back uh, at the beginning, when you're talking about uh, the Oh, what was it? The file names. Mm -hmm. um, a couple of questions about that. Uh, so one from Catherine, who's wondering, what if the a, a photo has, you know, it's a group photo. How would you name that uh, that kind of a picture? So a group photo. That's a question that comes up a lot. With how am I going to file my photo as well? Okay. And sort of the rule of the. Th rule of thumb with filing that picture would be you file it under the name of the oldest person that you can identify in the picture or the youngest person. It's up to you really. Oh. And so in that case, the file name could be a group portrait and the name of the family. I would just keep it as group portrait name of the family okay. as a file name. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank keep you. Keep it simple. Thank you for that recommendation. Uh, what about metadata? Florence is wondering, can you add metadata to a picture? You know, when you're showing up at MyHeritage, uh, you can add information there. Is it also possible to just add data to a, an actual file of a picture? Yes, and that's separate from putting them up on MyHeritage. So if you okay. want to add metadata to your photos, the tricky part of metadata these days is you have to make sure that the program you're using to add that metadata, that you'll actually be able to retain that metadata with your photo. A lot of programs strip it out when you download it or you move it to another program. Okay. There is a program that I've been using uh, is it okay to mention it? No, absolutely. Go ahead. Yeah, okay. So I really like using a fairly new program. It's a photo organizer called Memory Web. And it's memoryweb.me. And, you know, tell them I sent you. They answer your questions. They have lots of tutorials on their website. But the wonderful thing that they do is they've figured out a way so that when you add your metadata, which is your keywords and descriptors, to that image in their program, when you download the picture, the metadata stays with it. That is not the case with many other, with most of the other uh, photo organizers. You okay. spend all that time adding all that information and then whoosh, it's gone. Okay. Doesn't that sound like a nightmare? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking... Uh... Gosh, in like Photoshop Elements, I think it's an extra step you have to do to tell it to actually write that data to the actual image. So, yeah, if you forget to do that, then exactly you're what you're describing, yeah. Mm. Um, question from Elizabeth, uh, who says, once we think we know who is in the photo, since people change so much over the years, how do we prove it is who we think it is? <laughs> That is what photo identification is all about. <laughs> okay. But no, no, no. So you think about that photograph, and maybe you think you have other in photographs of the same individual, right? I think this is what we're talking yeah. about. Uh -huh. I like to put those pictures in a timeline order and see if you can, and do it with yourself, although it's really scary when you do that, 
um, see how that person changes over time. And when you're trying to compare two faces, you're really thinking about all the really the details in someone's face that you sometimes notice and sometimes you don't. Like the nose, the shape and, and the length of the nose, the ears are very specific to a person. The eyes, the eyebrows, the spacing between the eyes and the eyebrows, the hairline, although that can change, as we know, as you get older, uh, the shape of the mouth, shape of the face, all of those things have to agree for it to be the same person. And of course, as we know, some people go through radical changes from like being little kids to being older. Other people look the same throughout their lives. It's all about paying attention to the details. It can be quite tricky. Okay. Yeah, very good. Thank you. Question from Linda about uploading her photos uh, to a MyHeritage uh, account. Can I post a photo of me and my cousins at an old family uh, Christmas gathering, or do I need to get their permission first? My take on that is that if you should always get the permission of your family before you use pictures of living people. Okay. Uh, but just because it's good politics in your family, you don't want your cousin to suddenly say, I didn't give you permission to use my photograph, thus starting a new family feud. Yeah. You you can put the photograph up there, but it is a good idea to check with your family and make sure they're okay with it, especially when you have pictures of living people. Okay. Uh, now, here's a question that uh, maybe you, Maureen, or Daniel can chip uh, chime in on. Uh, from Ron, he's wondering, can individual albums up at MyHeritage be set to public or private, or is there just one privacy setting for the entire account? Any thoughts, Daniel? Oh, yeah, sure. I already answered that in writing, I think. Uh, hello, everybody. Hi. Uh, the privatization goes by albums, and once you set one or multiple albums uh, public, all the images, all the photos that you upload to that album will be public. Uh, privatization is not happening or not set by uh, specific photos. Okay. Uh, thank you, Daniel. Hey, while well, I've got you here, Daniel, <laughs> uh, Cassandra's wondering, can you attach a photo to an event or to a place as opposed to just uh, to a person? Well, not exactly as Maureen uh, described it uh, magnificently uh, today. Uh, you can do, you can attach a photo to a source citation uh, of a fact that happened of, in a specific time and place. Uh, so if you have a picture of, uh, of a document, that document will be part of the source citation. And, and that can be done under the source citations area okay. uh, of the website. And then finally, what what do the two of you think about uh, what resolution or, or DPI, and this is a question from Stephanie, uh, what resolution would you use for uploading a photo to MyHeritage? Now, Maureen, earlier you mentioned, I think, between 600 and 1,200 and save as a TIFF. Uh, would would you op upload that to MyHeritage or any, any needs to adjust that? Uh, that's a preservation standard, the 600 to 1,200 DPI. That's from the Library of Congress. Um, standard. You could, but generally, you know, our website resolutions, our, des our desktop resolution, it, you know, doesn't have to be that high. I usually recommend people n don't upload more than 72 to 150 okay. DPI. I don't know about you, Daniel. What do you recommend? Well, I definitely agree with you, Maureen. Uh, you can keep on uh, on a hard drive a, as a backup for you the original photo and TIFF and and 600 or a, or a thousand two hundred DPI uh, like if you would like to print it again later on uh, but uh, definitely do you don't need to upload a high resolution image to the MyHeritage website okay as long as you have that original. Uh, you know, on your computer or backed up somewhere else also, right? Um, mm -hmm. Good. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mike has a question. He says, I've got lots of old photos. Is there an, a recommendation for purchasing a photo scanner product? 
How would yes. you respond to Mike? So there are def there are definitely different types of photo scanners, but I think if you have a lot of photographs, you should invest in a desktop flatbed scanner. And I love my Epson. Uh, there are all kinds of Epsons for all different price ranges. Read the reviews, see which one seems to fit both your budget. Uh, but it doesn't have to be an Epson. I've just, I've used an Epson forever. And then there are portable scanners. So if you're going to go visit, uh, or you're going to go to a family reunion and everyone's going to bring their photos and you want to scan as many as possible, you know, you could bring your flatbed scanner. I have one that fits in a little rolly suitcase. But you can also invest in something like a Flip Pal, which is a portable photo scanner. Um, it doesn't do TIFFs, but you can convert the 600 DPI JPEG to a TIFF. And a question that often comes up related to that specifically is when you when you do convert it to a TIFF, does it add any additional quality to it, or or does it? Uh, what what's the consequence so, of saving to a TIFF? Well, if you save to a TIFF, you want to scan to a TIFF file. What happens is the more times you open that image, you don't actually lose any of the image quality. But on a JPEG, you do lose some image quality the more you play with the picture. Yeah. Is it the the more you play with it? Does that does that what does that mean? Does that mean uh, you make edits and then save those yeah, changes? It, you you want to keep it as a TIFF file whenever possible, except when you're going to upload to a website. Then so most people have different or well, should have. Uh, I, I do for a lot of my pictures have different resolution images that I use. Like this one's going onto this particular website at 72 DPI, then I, as a JPEG, and then I have my TIFF files, which are my preservation quality. You always want to be able to have your preservation quality scans um, separate, maybe, from the ones that you're going to upload. Okay. You don't need to upload a TIFF file. Just a JPEG is good for uploading. All right. Uh, thank you, Maureen. Let's go to a question from Willene. Uh, and Daniel, uh, perhaps perhaps you're still there uh, for this one. If you accept a photo of a person and it appears in your own tree as the profile of that person, can you change that profile picture if you prefer a different photo that you might already have? So before I answer yes to that question, uh, let me clarify something. Okay. Uh, photo discoveries will appear uh, for you only if you are missing the profile picture for an individual. Oh, okay. So the idea is just to fill the blanks with the photos that you are missing. Uh, but if you accept other matches or you get uh, more than, than one picture for an individual in your tree, you can always change and, and kind of update which one you want to be the profile picture. Okay. Um, thanks, Daniel. Now, Maureen, what about old slides? Are there any techniques or special equipment? Is it possible to digitize slides? It is possible to digitize slides. <laughs> okay. You can, so on, on some scanners, flatbed scanners, you can actually get a slide attachment to help you do that. Okay. Uh, there are also specific slide scanners that you can purchase that make it a lot easier. You can even, if you have a lot of slides, you can send them out to a scanning service. Uh, there's quite a number of them out there. Just use one that's highly rated. Okay. I know which ones I recommend. Uh, scan, uh, scan Digital is one of the services that I recommend, but everyone has their favorite. So go online and look for slide scanning services. Okay. Maybe someplace local to you may have the ability to scan them as well. And yeah. then, you, then, of course, you get them on a... Um, they send them back, right? They send the slides back, but then you also have all those digital files. You yeah. have to go in and rename all those digital files. Okay. Yeah, I remember so. I took a, a bag of my dad's slides into Walgreens, and they just did them all real quick through their whatever machine they had, and, and they came back just fine. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay, so Carolyn has this question. Um, what about using a... You know, our, our cell phones these days are also cameras. Um, do they are they good enough? Can can we take a picture of something and upload it? Upload that picture to our MyHeritage account. 
Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, that your cell phone cameras are pretty good, depending on what type of cell phone you have. Uh, and you can then save those images to your iCloud account or hard drive, wherever you're going to save it, and then upload it to my heritage. Okay. And if I remember in one of our recent webinars on uh, using MyHeritage's mobile app, uh, mm -hmm. if you take a picture through that app, it will it will directly upload and sync to your tree. So I th that's perfect. I, yeah, I think that's a neat option there too. Uh, question back on the file naming, Maureen. Uh, this is from Janet, who is wondering: Do what about the underscores in a file name? Uh, are those necessary? Can we do without those? Uh, tell us a little bit about underscores in a file name. So underscores separate information without other things getting in the way. So you can't do like Taylor dot right. But you could do Taylor underscore. You don't necessarily want to do Taylor space, but the underscore keeps the name, parts of the name separated. Okay. It's just a convention. Okay. Now, here's a, here's a question from Cassandra, and, and uh, either one of you uh, have a stab at this. Is there a limit for the number of photos you can add to a tree? Um, either the number or file size? What do you think, Daniel? Uh, yes, there is a limitation, but depending on the plan that you have, uh, okay. the basic will allow you, if I'm not mistaken, and I was looking uh, for the URL with that information on the website, I think it's 2.5 gigabytes of uh, images. Then if you go premium or premium plus, uh, the premium plus will give you unlimited uh, space okay. uh, to put as many pictures as you want up there. Okay. Well, good. So it sounds like it's possible to really have an online off-site uh, repository for all of these um, up at my heritage. Thank you. Uh, that's other good questions here. Uh, this from Richard. Would there be a problem in the future if the name, if that file name needs to be changed or expanded, Maureen, uh, for example, adding that extra zero, uh, is, is that going to cause problems for any reason if, if that's needed to be done? I don't think so. Okay. Because I edit my file names all the time. Like, okay. like in some cases, you, you only know the surname of the person but not the first name, and then later you go in and you right-click and change the file name. I, I haven't had any trouble with that. Okay. And what if you move it around on your computer from one spot to another spot? Any Anything that you've experienced with that? No. Okay. No, it's pretty simple. Okay, Richard. So there you go. Um, I try to keep everything simple. Okay. I like that. Adria is wondering, do you, she says, what, what other documents might give us photos of ancestors? Do you have any, any favorites, uh, I don't know, passport applications, or are there any genealogical documents you can think of that we might be overlooking that where we might find a picture of an ancestor? Oh, there's so many places to look for pictures of ancestors. One of the one one thing that surprised me was a friend of mine came forward with her husband's grandfather's picture on his health record from the pediatrician's office. Huh. And I thought that was pretty neat. But definitely passport photos are overlooked. Sometimes citizenship papers have pictures. Sometimes, oh, where was I? I guess I was at... A, a, a archive here in Rhode Island and they had pulled out a naturalization paper uh, file and in it were, was all this documentation. It was a, it was a gold mine of things. And I thought, boy, I wish that person were my ancestor. <laughs> there were pictures and marriage licenses. And I mean, it was everything you could ever want uh, in that file. Huh. Well, wow. just keep looking. They're everywhere. Licenses, work passes, Genealogy, school books, yearbooks. 20th century is a boom time for images of, of people yeah. on document 
documents. So yeah, Adrian's wondering about the passports. Did did photos always exist with passports, or when did they when did they start showing up there? Do you know? I actually do know that, oh, wow. but I don't have that information. Uh, wait a minute, at my fingertips. Okay. <laughs> that little book. Uh, I have a little book called Searching for Family Photographs, and in it there's a chart that tells you exactly, I don't even have one here in my office, if you can believe that, um, that actually gives you specific dates when photographs appeared in documents. And it'll tell you when they first started really? using passport pictures. Interesting. So what, what's that book called? Searching for, Searching for Family Photographs. Searching, and do you know who the author of that is? Me. Oh, that's by Maureen. <laughs> oh, okay. So searching... So so you do know the author is what you're saying. I do know the author. Okay. I know her well. So I'm uh, I'm just curious available up at your website? I uh, I actually have I believe taken it out of circulation okay. because I'm updating it, but it is available I believe. Hold on. Maybe at Amazon or at your might be, at a yeah. library or at least through WorldCat would tell you where what what library yeah. might have it. Oh, there it is. Searching for family history photos. How to get them now? Okay. All right. It needs to be updated, but that chart is timeless. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Now, Maureen, I've got a I've got several questions here about uh, actually writing on a photograph. Can we do it? If so, is there a certain kind of utensil? Um, you know, what, what are your thoughts on that? There's a lot of back and forth about whether or not you should write on the back of your photograph or not. If you use a very soft lead pencil and you write small, uh, you can put some information on the back of the photograph up at the top edge or bottom edge and just be consistent. Other people, uh, you can use individual acid and lignin free sleeves you know those non-pvc plastic sleeves and then stick a piece of acid and lignin free cardstock behind it and then write all over the cardstock so that it's not coming in contact with the image you just never want to stick anything to a photograph because it generally will not come off okay all right this this is making me wonder, Maureen, if I got if I have more questions or if the audience has more questions like this. Uh, do you 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 have you hold events sometimes on your on your website or via Facebook Live? I do. Can you tell us about that? Sure. So if there are more questions, and I'm sure something will come up as soon as you pull out a box of photographs, there's a couple of ways that you can contact me. I do these Facebook Lives through my photo detective. Facebook page, and uh, I like to include uh, questions, audience questions. There's also a place on my webpage where you can ask Maureen and send me a query, and I do get to them. Uh, and then when you're on my website, over in the lower right-hand corner, this little help green thing will pop up. You can click that and send me a message as well. Okay, and I'm, I love to hear from people. I love to answer questions. And I'm pulling this up right now. Here's MaureenTaylor.com slash ask dash Maureen dot com or just come up here, click click here. Inquiry form, right? Yeah. And there's that little help button at the bottom of the screen on the right. Oh. Just in case. Well, okay. You can search questions, you can contact me. It all goes to the same inbox photo consultations you have various events events okay there's all kinds of things on my website those little last muster movies are on my website under projects so you can watch those we made a decision to have the revolutionary trio be publicly available huh. to people okay so if you go to projects and do the drop down and go right revolutionary here. trio yep click that there are the three movies that we were able to make, and many of your listeners may have contributed to our Kickstarter campaign yeah, five years I remember ago. That. Yeah, so it took us a long time, but we're done. They're all right here. Yes. Huh. Well, I'm gonna 
let's just grab that link I'll go stick that in your chat area also so you have one click access to that everyone um, let's just let's just ask uh, one or two more questions here Maureen and and sure you're you're doing great I appreciate it uh, Debbie's wondering so on the back of a of a photo um, she says on the back of a cardboard photo there's uh, an inscription that's in pencil and she can read some of the letters and numbers but not enough to really make a definite identification she's she's afraid that that pencil um, dust will eventually disappear it's about a hundred years old uh, any any recommendations for her where would she says where would I go to get help in reading the back of that photo <laughs> well you should scan it I always scan the front and the back of my pictures, especially with information. And sometimes the pencil can get rather faint. So you can use your photo editing programs to enhance that. You play with all the tools in like uh, vividpix.com, that, that, um, that new restoration software you can play with. I was actually doing that the other day. I bought a Revolutionary War possibility person veteran and I couldn't read the back so I was playing with the software trying to get that caption to pop up um, one of the other things you can do is basically if you need help reading the caption a lot of people put those up on Facebook and people love to sort of weigh in on what does it say on the back of this photo yeah yeah good idea can you read this handwriting I did that with a foreign photo yeah. that I had in my collection that we found after my dad uh, passed and it was in Japanese, and it went around the world, and I got an answer. Oh, really? Oh, good. Good. So use Facebook. That's great. Let's, uh... <laughs> Facebook is good. I wouldn't <laughs> use it for just general photo identification, but yeah. to read a caption, it can help you see it in a different way. But I always scan the front and the back of the picture. If anybody needs any help whatsoever, you know, go to my website, MaureenTaylor.com. I do offer photo consults, and I, I, I love meeting with people and talking through their photo concerns and questions and their photo identifications and working with them to, to give those photographs a name so they don't end up abandoned. Great. It, it reminds me, Maureen, I recently, this was just within the last several months, I, I've, got a, I've got a photo that's probably the 1860s, and it's in one of these um, small, real uh, frail cases. And uh, I somehow I took the photo either fell out or I took it out. And, and I, I looked at the back of the photo for the first time ever, and it had in, in kind of scratched onto it the address. Uh, or it, it was an N address, and I wasn't sure what it was, and so I used Google Maps to search for that address. And sure enough, that's where that's where this person's son ended up living later on in his life. Uh, so that was kind of a cool discovery to actually look at that, see the back of that photo for the first time. Well, I collect photographs, Jeff, and so I go to these shows and I go to outside sales and you know all that kind of stuff looking yeah. for the most unusual things because I'm likely never to see them again except in somebody's photo collection you know a year from now and sometimes you can find photographs with a mailing address on the back so like the photographer has you know created one of those big colorful framed pictures and then here's the address on the back to mail the original photograph back uh -huh. after they've made the oh wow so it's kind of it's kind of cool. That is neat, huh? You never never know what you're going to find on the back. Sometimes I find entire family trees that someone has put on the back of a photograph. <laughs> is that right? A 19th century photograph. And somebody said, this is so-and-so. And then they'll draw the lines. De descended from this person wow. who's descended from this person. And I'm like, what is that? Of course I have to buy that yep. one. <laughs> so speaking of purchasing <laughs> photographs, uh, Penny writes in saying, my husband purchased a box of old photographs. Can you recommend a site that these photos could be posted? Uh, she's concerned there's there might be family members out there, and, and we'd love to get the photos to them. Any ideas Abs for Penny? Uh, absolutely. There's a website that's been around for a very long time. It's called deadfred.com. Okay. And you can upload images there. Uh, you can join the orphan photo rescue movement, of which I'm a... I'm a sort of member of 
where we post our images on various places and try to get them reconnected. Um, sometimes I, uh, I'm actually the focus for this year is to re is to gift back to historical societies some of these pictures that have ended up with names on the back and places and I just know a historical society will want them and then that someone can find them there. Uh, so there's a lot of things you can do with it. I have some blog posts about orphan photos if you go to my website. Okay. All right. Well, uh, this has been really enjoyable, Maureen. Uh, we've learned about you, photos. Uh, we've learned about my heritage. Uh, thank you, Daniel, for also being here. Uh, but any final thoughts, Maureen, before we say goodbye? Take care of your photos today so they don't become abandoned tomorrow. Mm. Very good advice. Uh, <laughs> and that from the photo detective. So Maureen Taylor dot com and myheritage dot com. Thanks, Maureen. Thanks, Daniel, and thanks to all of you wherever and whenever you are around the world for sharing part of your day with us. And remember, life is short. Do genealogy first. Bye, everyone. Bye, Maureen. Bye, Daniel. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>